Uh, hello, my name is Erasmus Sipilelem Selegu. I am from South Africa, and um, thank you for the great presentations to the last two speakers. Uh, so we've been to the east, we've been to the center, and now we're going to go to the very south, southern tip of Africa. Uh, so, uh, South Africa is obviously, as it says, in the south of Africa. Very simple to understand where it is. And it is a country that has three capitals, actually. Uh, so Pretoria is the seat of the president and the cabinet. Bloemfontein is the seat of the Supreme Court. And Cape Town is the seat of parliament. Uh, so we don't have one designated uh, capital besides maybe Pretoria having the most fundamental right due to the president's seat being there. Uh, the area is 1.2 million square kilometers, which is the ninth largest in Africa and I think 25th in the world. Uh, we have a population of just under 58 million and to the north of us we have our neighbors Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique and slightly to the east is a very small country Swaziland which uh, sits on the eastern coast. Uh, with Lesotho being a landlocked country within South Africa uh, which yeah, is very interesting. <laughs> uh, we have the Indian Ocean and the South Atlantic Ocean so we are blessed with a lot of coastlines uh, and uh, you will see all these, this, how these coastlines are affected in our natural landscape and also our tourist attractions later on. Uh, we use the currency, the RAND, and our economy is the second largest GDP in Africa with the, and 33rd in the world, and that's due to the minerals and agri agricultural export. Mining in, ISA has, in South Africa has been the country's <coughs> rise originally from an agricultural production economy to a global powerhouse. So it is one of the leaders, uh, leading countries in coal, gold and diamond pr production and we also have some of the, the largest reserves in these minerals. Uh, we also have the highest platinum and chromite production or like industries in the world. So I think that the country is very rich in minerals and is what has taken it to where it is uh, today. So before we go too far forward, we start looking at where South Africa has come from. Obviously. Uh, like many countries in Africa, we were colonized by the Dutch at first and then the British second. So the Dutch were in the Cape region, which is um, where they saw the, uh, a fruitful land and opportunities for growing crops. And the main uh, crops that they brought from the Netherlands and from France actually originally was to produce uh, wine, which again you'll see later on in the slide. So the potential for this uh, development was quite big for them and then the Dutch set in the Cape region. They also brought uh, a lot of slaves from uh, Southeast Asia actually, so Indonesia which you saw last week. Uh, a lot of slaves were, were brought in from the, uh, the, by the Dutch and also this brought rise to the ethnic groups which are the Cape Malay and the coloured community which is a, a mixed race community of uh, people, uh, uh, Dutch settlers with the slaves. Um, then the British settled and the country found it, um, the opportunity to discover gold as a mineral and then the, the British exploitation really began in the country. Uh, South Africa eventually gained its uh, nominal independence in 1910, uh, becoming the Union of South Africa. Um, and this image is one of the most striking images taken by a photographer uh, which depicts the idea of what most people are, know about South Africa, which is the apartheid government. So after 38 years of independence, uh, the National Party passed a law, which was the uh, apartheid law system in 1948. This was a, like, a terrible time in the country's history, uh, but something that we cannot let go of and uh, something that we often are uh, aware of what happens. So people of color were forcefully removed from the urban centers into villages and townships so that the valuable land would be allocated to whites only. Uh, Non-whites were allowed to be in the city centers, but only uh, to serve white people as laborers or, and working in construction or any service, low-skilled jobs. Um, and which is even more weird is that they had to carry a, a dompas, which is, uh, for, which is basically a passport for them to be in the city center. And if they did not carry that and they were found by these police, they would be beaten brutally, sometimes murdered or arrested. So it was yeah it was a very dark time and something that i don't think the country will ever let go of and it brings us to where we are now so this was again 50 years on from that point which is quite a long time many activists fought for the liberation of the land many global allies joined the country to fight for its freedom including sweden actually who were one of the largest contributors to, towards the liberation movement in south africa 
So the country broke away from the shackles of apartheid and it had its first elections, free elections for everyone in the country only in 1994, which is 26 years ago. Um, and that's kind of scary. Uh, so this is the new South African flag. And obviously on the left, you have Nelson Mandela, a uh, global icon who was part of the anti-apartheid movement. Um, and you see the, the new South African flag, which was made prominent in 1994, has the colors of the Af African National Congress, which is the main party in South Africa, with the same colors that you see from the uh, colors from the British and Dutch flags previously, which is the blue, white, and uh, green, uh, blue, white, and red. Uh, we have a very diverse and ethnic group in South Africa, so we, we still pride ourselves in being the rainbow nation, where 80% 80, uh, 80 of it is black, and then we have white, colored communities, as mentioned, and Indian, which is the Cape Malay and Indian communities that came down. We are majority 80% uh, Christian faith as well. So this is the, the one page which I was looking forward to, to like speaking about because we have uh, 11 official languages, which is fourth globally, number of official languages. Uh, on the left, I'll take you through the most common uh, ways and also you'll, you'll start hearing the Kosa, which is obviously one of our favorite languages. So Unjani is how are you in Zulu. Diabonga is Kosa for thank you. Tosins is Afrikaans for goodbye. And Ketebolo Gogobona is uh, pleased to meet you in Spedi. So these five languages are actually all in our national anthem along with English, uh, which, is, which is called Nkosi Sigileli Africa, which is God bless Africa. So the fun facts, as you guys may know, Isikosa has 15 uh, click sounds borrowed from the Kokoi San, Koko and San languages. Three of the main clicks being the letters Q, which we'll, we'll pronounce, uh, which, is, which is a very difficult uh, sound you make from the top of the tongue down. Uh, C, which is and X, which is, which is then the sound that you hear, you hear in the word Isikosa. So this sentence I have here is a very beautiful song by Mede Makeba, who is Mama Africa. And it's a click song, which is one of the uh, songs that went out internationally in the 60s and was one of the first African songs that made was prominent. Uh, so the sentence is, Sebe um, taba batin twane. And, um, I don't know if you guys can try and attempt to say it, but it is a very, it's very tricky, but I'll say it again very so, slowly. So it's um, So this is, a, yes, one of the hardest languages to actually wrap your, your tongue around if you're not a natural speaker, but uh, that is the beauty of Tosa and the language spoken in Wakanda, which is the fake uh, village in Black Panther, the movie is actually Tosa and Swahili. So then the next is, uh, who are we? Who are South Africans? So South Africans are resilient, passionate, hardworking, imaginative, graceful, kind, welcoming, diverse, and extremely proud people. Uh, and you can see that through the many, the diversity we have in the country has allowed us to like, have such incredible influences and contributors to the, the global scale and global landscape in terms of uh, the people and leaders. So we obviously have Nelson Roli Tlatla Mandela, who's an activist and a global icon, Elon Musk, who's obviously a genius and uh, uh, the inventor of Tesla and SpaceX. We have author J.R.L. Tolkien, who is the Lord of the Rings author, uh, Dr. Christian Barnard, who uh, was the first successful uh, heart transplant surgery in the world, uh, Nkota School in Cape Town, Miriam Mageba, again, who I spoke about, Mama Africa, who was the first African Grammy winner, and the, probably the most known person at the moment is uh, Trevor Noah, who is the the host of The Daily Show, which is one of the biggest talk show hosts, uh, talk shows in America. Uh, as mentioned before, we have an extremely diverse uh, population. So we have black, white, Indian, Cape Malay, and colored. And it's a very colorful country. And it's a very beautiful thing because of that and what has allowed the country to be so unique in many, many ways. Uh, so looking next at what we eat. Um, I, I was curious about putting the slide because I know a lot of people are obviously having Ramadan at the moment and are fasting. Uh, so I'll try and move through it very quickly. Um, uh, due to the, the spice roots and the influence from the Southeast Asians and Indian inhabitants we were brought over here, we have uh, truly inspired diversity in our food. Uh, we love using all types of spices and fruity flavors such as chutney. So it's truly like a remarkable like taste sensation. Uh, our national dish is boboti, which I actually made yesterday for, for the first time. So it's um, 
It's a Cape Malay dish, which is mincemeat with a sauce made of chutney, bread soaked in milk, curry powder, turmeric, garlic, grounded ginger, ginger, and then you bake it in the oven with the egg topping. So it's really delicious and makes a mixture of uh, a kind of a main course and a dessert, which I told already yesterday. And then we have a bunny chow, which is an Indian influence. Uh, we have biltong, which is dried game meat, such as ostrich and kudu. And then braying, which is like the, probably one of the most South African things. People love to watch sports, sit down uh, and have a shisanyama. And shisanyama is translated in, from Zulu to burn the meat, basically. It's as simple as that. And then you have that with various things like chakalaka, which is chutney and various sweet spices. And then pap, which is made from maize, maize meal. And then, yeah, so that is the food. Uh, what we wear is the next thing that we, we started looking at. So obviously with the many many different tribes and different cultural differences. There's a, a lot of things that we could say we wear, but the Nguni uh, tribe is obviously the largest group which has the Zulu and Kosa uh, cultures within them. So um, I wanted to depict this image of uh, the traditional Nguni tribe and their clothing. So this is obviously uh, in the wedding, the man would wear uh, imbata, which is uh, all made from cowhide. And uh, the umgeli, which is the, from the top, is usually made of leopard skin. Uh, the woman's uh, clothing is very ornamental with uh, lots of beautiful beadwork um, and it's, it's all yeah, very colorful and that derives from Nguni culture and patterns. So you see these patterns quite throughout in, in the culture. But I think what's also really significant to see is the contemporary fashion in South Africa has now led to this interpretation of these patterns and colors into its, into its uh, manifestation of the new fashion, which is something that I think is really great that we still maintain the heritage and the culture of, of the people within modern fashion and we don't let it go. So you see that uh, in these fabrics and clothes that are, are, are there. So then uh, the question is, what do we offer in terms of, a, of a, a landscape or why do people come to South Africa? So I'll start off with, we have really beautiful beaches. Um, uh, so the first one, uh, Thompson Bay is, on the east coast, uh, so Thompson's Bay is a warm Indian Ocean and there's lots of dolphins and snorkeling adventures. So lots of people often are there to see the dolphins, uh, which breach quite often. Then you have uh, Co Coffee Bay, which is in the southeast coast. And this is known for its breathtaking natural wonders, such as the hole in the wall. And many tourists come from all over the world to see this. And the, the natural landscape within Coffee Bay is just really remarkable. And then we have uh, this, the southwest coast, which is the, where Cape Town is. Uh, Cape Town and these beaches here is kind of the glitz and glam beaches of the Cape region. So we have the Atlantic Seaboard area, which is known for its um, really like prominent uh, fine sea facing properties, which you see along here, and they're really expensive. Uh, and then beaches like Clifton are also like well known and for places where they do a lot of uh, film shoots, uh, modeling shoots, and celebrities from around the world have been pictured here. So it's a, quite a, a prominent beach for the city of Cape Town. And on top of the beaches, we have remarkable mountains. I think it's safe to say that Table Mountain is a uh, na national park, is our national treasure and uh, the most iconic landmark in South Africa by a long shot. Uh, it sees approximately just under a million people annually and um, also has the highest uh, population of uh, uh, floral species in the world. Uh, the views from on top of the mountain. So this is actually Table Mountain here, and this is Lion's Tit. So she's looking across the Table Mountain at the Top Apostles. And um, so the views that you have from here, looking onto the city and the water's edges is, is really great. And this is another picture from Table Mountain, looking at the city again, it's just endless, <coughs> excuse me, coast. Uh, Blade River Canyon uh, is a very beautiful place. It's actually one of the, the, the on my list to see. I never, saw it until it, and now I sit here during this presentation. I'm just like, I should have seen it before leaving South Africa. Uh, but this is the, the third largest canyon in the world and the largest green canyon in the world. So it stretches 26 kilometers and it's about 800 meters deep. This shot specifically is, uh, this area or where this is taken is called God's Window, uh, which is named due to the sheer like natural beauty you see and just contained in one single view. And this is, the final one is Drakensberg Mountain, which is where I'm from. So I am from Kwazulu Natal and I'm Zulu speaking myself, uh, where we actually are the highest population of first language speaker, our Zulu people. 
So Drakensberg is, uh, again, as you can see, just dramatic. It's masterful, it's beautiful. And it's the highest mountain in Southern Africa. And it forms the border between KwaZulu-Natal province in, this, in South Africa and the kingdom of Lesotho. Uh, so South Africa's earliest inhabitants and original inhabitants, which is the Bushmen or the sand people, uh, actually left many beautiful rock painting and rock art here. So many tours come here to see this uh, early historical uh, data of like what, how people lived, where they lived and how they lived. Um, so then, uh, yeah, the mountains in South Africa are remarkable. I think it's something that if you come there, you have to see and uh, many tourists come for that. And then I didn't want to go too deeply into this because I know Patrick would be very upset because he obviously had his, his slide of, of the wildlife. But of course, like many places in, in Southern Africa, uh, South Africa is blessed with also just so many national parks. The most significant and popular being the Kruger National Park in Bumalanga. The, this park sees over a million visitors every year and has the Big Five, which Patrick has mentioned, so I won't go into that, and has many, uh, like 147 mam mammal species, 114 reptile species, and 507 bird species, so it really is quite a remarkable place. It is, however, I, would, I wouldn't recommend it. It's as beautiful as it is. It is an extremely expensive experience, and there's so many so many smaller more unique or not more unique but smaller and cheaper uh, safari experiences that you can do all over south africa so this one is probably the most significant one because it's the pride and joy of the country but it is also like real, really 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 expensive and then lastly for this uh, contribution of what we have to offer i think it's without without fail i don't know if you if you can mention south africa without mentioning or a tour of south africa without mentioning wine uh, wine is like our pride and joy uh, and South Africa is the eighth largest exporter of wine globally and, a contrib and this contributes approximately 600 million euros annually so you can understand how significant that is for the South African economy as well on top of the agricultural exports of sugarcane and everything else and then minerals so this is a big contributor to the economy um, so we love wine for so many other reasons, but that is one of them too. Uh, and as you can see, South Africa has like these incredible vineyards set among, among like these beautiful mountains. And Franschhoek and Stellenbosch uh, to the left and right are the most popular of the wine region vineyards, uh, with many of our top wines coming from these two. Uh, our wine farms are like extremely popular for tourists and, and locals alike. Uh, in summer regions uh, often have picnics as you can see here uh, they have amazing restaurants wine tasting and to be honest like it's become quite a kind of a, a fad or a very popular place for people to to do this kind of stuff so like if you if you're an instagrammer wine farms are generally the place that everyone uh, ends up going to uh, so that is the loss of this and uh, of these uh, things that we offer but i think it's really hard to speak about South africa and, and show all these beautiful things and then also not uh, like kind of be true to what actually happens in the country. So even though we have spent and does a lot of part of this presentation speaking about this kind of lifestyle of, of beauty and perfection and the perfect shot on Instagram, uh, there's two sides to every story. And even though we have this absolute beauty in our country, we also are faced with a very problematic scenario where South Africa has some of, some of the like, highest income inequality in the world. So even though there's such great wealth, there's also such extreme poverty that you face. And, and you see places that don't have uh, natural services like water, uh, electricity, and any basic services. So people have to, to, to line up to, for a single point. Some places don't have toilets. So large groups of people have one toilet to share amongst the whole community. There's high densities and scenarios like the COVID-19, we find ourselves in, in a dire situation where we cannot let this uh, contain in such environments. Um, and last year, we, there was an article in Times Magazine, which was um, uh, South Africa, the world's most unequal country. And again, it shows a very stark image where on the right, you have a very dense populated informal settlement. And to the left, you have uh, suburbs with pools and a school and people with large yards and so much space. And it's just like literally one side to the other. So it's, it's just kind of scary when you see this. And again, you see this in most global South places like India and South America too. 
And, uh, and then it's these kind of stock images that you see where you see the most expensive single residential homes sold in Africa in Cape Town, uh, which sometimes I feel bad because I, as an architect, I worked in the practice that designed this. So like, this is the kind of work that we were doing. And when you come to Cape Town and when you go to South Africa, like all those images I showed before, it's very easy to be caught up in this life. And then you kind of forget that this is actually the stock realization of what we are facing in South Africa and in most, again, global South countries. So uh, I will end by saying that um, there's always two sides to every story. And yeah, bonga, bye, thank you, thank you. Please visit South Africa. It's a very beautiful country. And I think the people are so warm and friendly and would love to show you around the beautiful sites and for you to experience uh, what a beautiful country and how beautiful the people are. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. Uh, we can have questions. I'll try to go back and uh, read them out, I guess. But anyone can use the microphone to ask. I can, I can start. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Yeah, beautiful presentation by each one of you. Uh, and, and, and you, Erasmus, thank you so much Like to show two sides of the story. Even the way you brought it, that was really nice, like really cool. <laughs> like. Very diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I always out here when I'm asked, I start with that and then I say, yeah, and we have issues. And but anyway, I wanted to ask uh, you to comment about uh, the way South African has been the exophobia thing against uh, Africans, like fellow Africans within South Africa. What, what is that issue? Maybe in summary. Uh, that, that issue has been, unfortunately, uh, th first of all, thank you very much for the, the comments. And uh, it's, it's really, that, that is a question that's very deep and, and saddening to the country because we do live in a country that is extremely xenophobic. So on top of all these other issues that we've had uh, with apartheid and the friction we've had with different races, we also have become very racist towards our own people. So due to those kind of restrictions and all these things that have happened before, there's a lot of foreign people who have come to South Africa because there's a lot, there's a lot it offers to many neighboring countries who don't have the same wealth that, we, that the country has. So people come look for work there. And with the extreme poverty that you saw at the end, those people then become very tense. It causes a tension of like having more people fighting for the smaller jobs that are actually available to such a large amount of people. So although it's not the, the whole country that feels that, it's a large... I, as, you, as you know and you, you read, it's, it, the xenophobia is a, is a massive issue that we have in South Africa. And it's something that I strongly am completely against and I don't know why anyone would just, regardless of anyone, there's no need for that hatred, there's no need for that animosity. We've all come so far. I mean, the mm -hmm. country's really come so far to where it is right now compared to where it was like 40 years ago and 100 years ago. So like we've, we've done great. So I, I hope that we can like just like we did in apartheid we can actually like stop this too like it's ridiculous <laughs> it's, like, it's like watching a stupid movie I'm like what are you guys doing guys let's love each other these people deserve the same chance that you deserve yeah um so yeah okay a question have you seen all of the big five okay <laughs> yes if i remember i think i've seen i think i've seen all of them Wow. Though they escaped my memories. <laughs> Sorry, it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I've seen, I've seen them. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think somebody asked if I've slept in a traditional Yeah, have house. you ever seen Yeah, that we had one in our home before we were able to have a better house. But it was a good one. It was, it was warm. And you feel more secure inside. I mean, I, I totally understand. Like vernacular architecture is really made for whatever your climate is, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Patrick should tell us if Kenya is named after Kenyatta. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So it, it's a coincidence. It's a coincidence. So Kenyatta is, is, a, is a Maasai word. And how Kenya was named is still, is still not clear how, how the word Kenya came, but it's a coincidence that the first president was Kenyatta 
and the and the name for Kenya is Kenya. So mm. it's not because actually okay, Jomo Kenyatta International Airport was named after the first president, and most institutions called Kenyatta are named after him. But Kenya, because Kenya existed before him being the president, it was called Kenya before him being the president. So maybe Kenyatta is named after Kenya. Yeah. What does Harambe in the national seal of Kenya mean? So Harambe means uh, unity we pull together. Like I said, the Kenya society is, uh, your problem is my problem. So if we have a problem, we come together, we say Harambe. Harambe means we will, we pull it together, we pull together, I mean unity. Nice. Yeah. Oh, for Didier, how much does it cost to get that traditional haircut? <laughs> it's not really to cost like uh, here in Sweden, it's like 50 crown, only 50 crown. Wow. Yeah. You should, so you should get one like that then. Yeah, I, I'm planning to, to have that one. <laughs> Where is the hotel located, the one you showed us? It is located in the north in uh, Volcano Park. Okay. Uh, the movie Hotel Rwanda is based on the story of the genocide? Yeah, they were interpreting what happened in the 1994. Nice. Okay, hold on. I think everyone was impressed by uh, Raz saying the clicking. <laughs> the click you guys want to learn how to do it? <laughs> <laughs> We will yeah. just, I no. think somebody has asked if it is safe to go to these countries like Kenya, Rwanda, and South Africa. Yeah, it's yeah it is. Now. It is. It is quite safe. Obviously, the other forms of terror is is terror to the whole world. So you cannot isolate particularly those regions. Otherwise, uh, it is quite safe. And yeah, the, the, you you have to feel safe when you go to those places. The people are friendly and. Yeah, so if you have plans, you should go. And I've added uh, on the chat, uh, get a local guide if you want to go, even for Erasmus probably would share with me that. Look, uh, get a local guide if you're going to go to the dingy, in quote unquote, meaning uh, places that are a bit like in the city, there are places that are safer and there are places that are not really, really safe. The same as Stockholm, there are corners, I cannot just decide, yeah. oh, I'm just gonna walk around. So yeah, just I think that would be for your help. But you can actually do uh, tourism alone. You don't need any. Just be careful where you where you're going. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, for South Africa, I think it's yes and no. It's safe. So like in majority of this, like Cape Town is probably the safest city in the country. But Johannesburg, in the cities, like everyone says, if you're alert, it's it's fine. But you have to be alert. Johannesburg has a lot of of theft and petty crime so it's not a place that you can be like you can't buy it you know <laughs> you gotta be like aware when you walk around because it is a dangerous city but it is a big it's a big big city with lots of things that happen and people are hungry as well so with that kind of extreme like we saw at the end you you have those people with wealth and then people with nothing there's going to be friction and yeah, so you have to be alert when you're around south africa unfortunately mm -hmm. We get this question a lot, I think, also last time, and I think the general answer is just to be be very careful yourself. Like as a tourist, uh, cities are always going to be, you know, areas where of opportunity. <laughs> mm. So it's just more of being aware and alert all the time. Know the laws. If you're in Japan, you should always have your passport. That's that is like you just you should know where you're going. <laughs> uh, what else did we have? Any other questions? I see somebody yeah. said Rasmus, no one mentioned rugby. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I wanted to show the photo of the Springboks with the Rugby World Cup trophy because we are the world champions, but I thought it would be just a bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> like, we, we're going to maintain some modesty. No, 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 my friend, this is your country. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, we are the world champions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Raz. Mention it. We have I, in it. I had to. I was like, I need to cut down slides. <laughs> so like, it was there, and I was like, ah, oh, this is gonna. Be My nice. friend, I was popular, and it was South Africa, so I had to explain to some Swedish friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we the champions. <laughs> Well, well, it's funny because my, my wife is British and I watched the Rugby World Cup final in a British pub in Stockholm. And I was like, what the only South African person, you know, goes, you get And it was like, oh. And it was amazing. I mean, England uh, beat uh, the old all blacks. blacks. Yeah. I thought that they got the, the World Cup in their hands and it was like amazing. Yeah. Now, you know, when they send the anthem and I saw the team, I, I just knew it. You know, you can see when people are, are like, they're ready to put their body in the line on the, like their body on the line for it. And it's one of those things where it's like, these guys are hungry. These guys want to do it. And it, that what happened with that World Cup victory was it united the country, you know, after a lot of this, again, xenophobia and frustration happening in the country again, that moment was bang. It, nothing mattered besides we are one united South Africa. And that was the same that happened in 95 when Nelson Mandela was there to pick up the trophy with Franz Apirina. So it was like really, really beautiful. I'm getting goosebumps talking about <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, Russ, uh, yeah, to be sincere, these sports have really brought our countries together. Like there are moments that we, we go apart as a country, but when these uh, national moments do come, they bring us together and we cheer up and they bring more positive impact. So, so that's why we are proud of sports. Yeah, sports is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, quick... Question, do most South Africans have a distinct accent when they are speaking English? I, I saw that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it, 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 like the country varies. Like, peop, like Afrikaans people have an accent, Zulu people have an accent. So when, and when I speak Zulu, you know, I change. My tone changes and everything changes because it's my mm. first language, as you understand. But depending on what schools you go to, you know, like that varies so much. And that is pretty much, I'm, I'm sure, like you Oro said last week, you know, where, where you are from will, will definitely, you know, the, your accent will be adapted to that. So I went to a very English speaking school. So it was a very small population of, of black people and Indian people. So you, mm -hmm. is, is, you know, and you grew up for many years around that same kind of thing and your, your accent adapts to that. So I think if you go to South Africa, you'll hear like 45 million different English accents, <laughs> which is which is then really funny. But I mean, I don't know if it happens with you, but when I hear a Filipino English accent, I know. <laughs> Even if I don't see them. <laughs> I don't know about you, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I think most of the African languages do affect a lot of English pronunciations. Unless you went, you began speaking English far much before the, mo the mother tongue or the local language took mm. root in you. Yeah. Any other questions? Someone, uh, thank someone had asked you. Presentations. I wanted to uh, make a comment that none of you guys mentioned like uh, the friendliness of people in our countries. I did say that. <laughs> <laughs> like no. You don't even comment on it at all. Well, we should have shown in a, in a photo. We should have a complete slide. <laughs> yeah, we are friendly. <laughs> Next to those people, I said all those things and they did smiles. Everyone, big smiles, like Africa, we are South African. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe in Kenya, in Kenya, food is served with a smile. So, I mean, people are friendly. So good. Yeah, but sometimes it's hard to explain how people are friendly, you know? Yeah, that's yeah. true. I think also, everyone's like, oh, our countrymen are so friendly. <laughs> yeah. Also, people aren't friendly. Like, you know, we discussed earlier with the, the xenophobia. Now, it's scary. You can say that mm -hmm. we're friendly because we are friendly, but then also there's terrible people <laughs> yeah. in the country. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's how it is. <laughs> it's, it's a tricky one. I mean, in Sweden, I have met both in equal measure you meet today a very friendly person 
the next day you're like uh okay <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same all the world i mean they are very, very friendly same what we're saying two sides of the yeah. point yeah 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 yeah, but I hope Raz, because of due to, because of your your urban planning, you can create a bridge to connect the two sides of the. <laughs> well, that, that that's the aim, right? We we're doing this because, like I said, I, I worked for that office that was doing the, all that luxury houses, and then I got to a point where it really it 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 hurt. I, I I was lying to myself, and I was like, "This is fine for me to do. I can design these multi-million dollar houses, but who for?" And then I thought sustainable urban planning would be where you can make a lot of contribution and you can learn so much more and help so many more people. So that was where it came down to.